uncertainty in almost every aspect of our lives, it's time for a reset. Over the next hour, we'll celebrate mental wellness in the workplace, a Yahoo special in partnership with Fortune. Reset your mindset at work. We'll hear from a host of business leaders, newsmakers, and influencers on how we can emerge from this crisis stronger than before. Among our guests, Shark Tank investor and Dallas Mavericks owner, Mark Cuban. So I personally think this is a chance, this reset is an opportunity for us to do a couple new things that four months ago I would have been totally, totally against. We'll also hear from sports legend, Serena Williams. This is a really good time to just take care of me and other people should think about it that way too. Also joining us, the president of the American Medical Association, Dr. Patrice Harris, and the CEO of WW International, Mindy Grossman, as we examine how we can return to work safely. All that and a lot more on this Yahoo special in partnership with Fortune. Reset your mindset at work. Hello and welcome to Reset Your Mindset at Work. I'm Julia LaRoche, a correspondent for Young Finance, and I'm excited to bring to you this hour jam-packed with some noteworthy guests to have a powerful and uplifting and meaningful conversation around mental wellness in the workplace and what the workplace of the future will look like in the next normal. Now, I would like to bring in Yahoo Finance's editor-in-chief, Andy Serwer, and you have the ear of the C-suite. I know you have been talking to so many CEOs and business leaders throughout this pandemic. What are you hearing from them? Well, Julia, first of all, um, I think there's been an abrupt change. To be quite honest with you, mental health has been sort of a sideshow at work. And to the extent that chief executives even thought about mindfulness, often they would just bring in a consultant and sort of leave it at that. But now with all this working at home, Mental health has taken a new urgency and it's become a front and center issue. So now executives and other managers are having to deal with mental health and mindfulness on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's calling for new strategies, new ways of coping with working with people and making sure they're engaged and working well within the organization. So we're starting to see just a whole new way of work beginning to unfold. Uh, Andy, I'm, I'm, glad, and I'm glad that you brought up strategy because you're right. I think businesses are starting to rethink strategy and that mental health is a smart strategy in the workplace. And our next guest, um, I'm so pleased to welcome Mark Bertolini, the former CEO of Aetna, along with Johnson & Johnson's Chief Human Resources Officer, Peter Fasolo, to talk about mental wellness in the workplace. Uh, Mark Bertolini, I want to start with you. Because I know that mental wellness, mindfulness, it's so personal to you. You have these two life events that were really changing for you. And it changed the way that you ran Aetna. I was hoping you could share with our viewers about your own experience. Yeah, I think as a result of um, having to sit with my son for a year in the hospital as he fought cancer and my own accident, I realized that the system was not set up to create or recreate the human experience for you after you got well, quote unquote. It was more about you got well, the thing that you had that was wrong was fixed and you could go back into your world. And I very quickly realized that the whole person needed to be addressed when re-entering the world that they used to be in, realizing both that it's not gonna be normal like it was before, that you had to reinvent yourself to some degree and you had to have a set of practices that allowed you to see the world in a different way, in a more productive way, and a more wholesome way. And, and Peter, I know that at Johnson & Johnson, you have talked about creating the healthiest workforce, and I'm wondering how mental health, uh, the mindfulness, the mental well-being plays into that strategy, and what kind of results you all have seen? Well, Julia, first of all, thank you for having me. And we do, at Johnson & Johnson, look at the health of our employees in the most holistic way. We set out goals to have the healthiest workforce on the planet. And that means mentally healthy, spiritually healthy, nutritionally healthy, and emotionally healthy. And we have a range of programs and approaches to do that. And we just like Mark's experience at Aetna, we have uh, tried to really look at the outcomes of this, but we also understand that employees don't check themselves at the door. 
when they come into the uh, facilities at Johnson & Johnson. So we wanna make sure that people are looking at their lives in the, in the richest, most comprehensive manner. And now with COVID-19, it has become even more paramount as close to two thirds of our workforce are working from home and dealing with the array of balances that they have to deal with, child care, elder care, uh, bouts of loneliness, and staying connected and collaborating in ways to ensure that mental health is at the forefront of what our employees are doing is even more important now than it ever has been. Yeah, and Mark, um, Peter was just right referencing the, the investments they made. I know, Aetna, you did the same thing. And we've had this conversation about investing in human capital, and it's something that needs to be addressed. And I was wondering if you think that part of it has to do with maybe a broken capitalist system that we have right now, and how you think we might rethink that on the other side of this crisis? I think it is a broken system, and we do need to rethink it. Um, people have been rethinking it, but I think we've been given lip service to the kinds of changes that need to happen. I think we measure, we've been measuring our economy for a long time on six financial flow of funds to determine the economy's health. And we looked at sort of tangentially productivity and skill sets as, as part of that solution. But what we really haven't realized is that the human condition in and of itself, where people live, how they live, the kind of circumstances they have when they're not at work, actually do matter and that's come fully to the fore here as we've gone through this this crisis this crisis has opened up a very clear idea where one little bug can actually shut down the world's economy and actually on a monthly basis 350 billion dollars is the toll that this is taking on our economy is actually more than we spend on health care on a monthly basis well that's a really startling statistic that you just brought up more than we spend on health care um, really incredible stuff. I, I want to ask you, Peter, uh, for your reaction to investing in human capital, rethinking that um, in the workplace. Do you think that's something that's going to start to change on the other side of this? Well, I think uh, companies like Johnson & Johnson and other global corporations need to continuously remind themselves that when it comes to the health and wellness of your employees, you have to think in terms of prevention, wellness, I think Mark's right, is by the time it gets to the outcome, you're trying to fix things and sometimes it's a bit too late or it gets more complicated or more expensive. And what we try to do at Johnson & Johnson is invest heavily in prevention, wellness, in terms of know your numbers, ensure that you're taking mental health breaks, that we have healthy cafeteria, fitness centers, and make sure that people access uh, to programs like EAP and resiliency training and fitness training. No one program or, in, or intervention is going to hit the uh, specific outcome you're looking for. It's the strategy and the holistic approach you take toward your, toward your employees, which is an investment model, which is a commitment model and an engagement model so that you have a long-term investment in your employees because most companies like Johnson & Johnson are in the innovation business and you need employees to bring their whole selves to work and you have to make sure that you're protecting them and that you're keeping them safe and that you're investing behind them. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that's really remarkable to me is that you're seeing the return on investment, if you will, there is an economic benefit to investing in your people. Um, Mark Bertolini, going back to what you just mentioned earlier, the fact that we're spending so much on healthcare yet, we really aren't seeing the outcomes um, I think even of the OECD nations, we spend more, yet we don't see the value. Do you think that we're, I guess, how could we fix that system? It just seems like it's broken right now. Well, I think we have to, and business people for, for, for decades have been trained to steward scarce resources and to put at risk plentiful resources. And for a long time, the scarce resources were financial resources and the plentiful resources were people. Just put another person on the line, train somebody else on the job, to do this work with somebody behind a terminal screen or on the phone. I think what's happened since probably the early 70s, what we've seen is a flip where financial capital is now plentiful and human capital is very scarce. Well-trained people who know how to learn and continually evolve with the kind of organization they're in. And we have not made those investments because quite frankly, as business people, we aren't rewarded by the tax system to do so. We can't depreciate 
our investment in people like we can in machines. So machines are a better economic spreadsheet outcome than people are. And I think we've lost our way as a result. So we've got to turn that around, start re spending more money in education. The single biggest thing we can do to restore the American dream and to improve the quality of our human capital over time is in K to three education where we teach people how to learn, how to read. We should stop teaching to tests, standardized tests, and teach these children how to learn based on the circumstances they're in. On the other side of it, we then need, with people that know how to learn, the ability to reskill people for the communities they live in, not necessarily for some job halfway across the country. Because social mobility, geographic mobility, labor mobility is all but stopped while people stay in their communities where their families are and their social networks are. Mark Bartolini, former CEO of Aetna, and Peter Fasolo, the Chief Human Resources Officer of Johnson & Johnson. Thank you both for your time. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Julia. Good seeing and you. now let's hear from former, or not former, let's hear from tennis legend Serena Williams, how she has been navigating the COVID-19 lockdown. I started quarantining a little bit earlier. So I was in the house a really long time. And then I was like, okay, I'm with the two-year-old who's amazing, but it's a lot of work every single day. And then she was in this phase where every word was mommy. And I loved it. But at the same time, I'm like, I, I can't hear this anymore. I can't hear mommy, mommy. It was definitely challenging, but we overcame it. And now we're in our Cinderella robes. I feel like I almost get to be normal. And that, as weird as it sounds, it's like amazing and I love it. I've been kind of just really enjoying every second that I get at home. And, you know, I haven't gotten tired. I haven't, in the beginning, it was definitely hard in the beginning. But once I got over that, I was like, I'm kind of in love with this um, staying at home life. Obviously, I'm rooting for businesses, which would include mine, <laughs> to be able to come back. But it's, it's good to just kind of take a break and just really focus on the things that are really important. My husband actually is like just different. So what he did is a long time ago before this happened, he rented himself a warehouse and he set up like his office and like all his like computer and like his camera so he can go live and all this other stuff. And he has like a separate office that's not at the house. So when this happened, <laughs> husbands take note. So when this happened, he already had this office that he goes to, which literally nobody is ever in except for himself. Everyone has been struggling with this whole thing. And I see all the memes on it, it online that talk about like quarantine, how you <laughs> everyone's getting a little thicker. But I really took out this time to take, to take and um, cleanse my body. Um, so I've been actually, I've been doing that since quarantining starts. So I've been doing these things 30 days and I would take like two days off and then I completed my second 30 days and I took like three days off and now I'm actually doing another cleanse for 60 days. Uh, um, excuse me. So those 60 days are intense. I'm doing another one for 60 days and they're intense, but I just eat really healthy. I cut off eating. I do intermittent fasting. I eat. I try to eat healthy and you know, it's no fun. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like, I want to drink in quarantine too, but I also want to be healthy when I go back out and play tennis. I want to feel super good. And this very rare do I as a tennis player have time to actually take care of me. And so I thought this is a really good time to just take care of me. And other people should think about it that way too, because this is like, you never really get to spend this much time at home. No. And you can cook for yourself. It's like a lot of stuff that you can really control what's actually going into your body. Work. I'm Julia LaRoche, and I'm excited to bring in our next guest. We have Mark Cuban, the the for, the this the found the the owner of the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Julia. All right, Mark. Well, you have been incredibly vocal throughout this COVID-19 pandemic, and you and I have talked about something that you call an American reset. What do you mean by that? 
you know, when everything's just upside down like it is right now, um, everything changes, you know, and that creates new opportunities. The bit, people who have been trying to do business like the way it's always been done are uncertain about how to bring their businesses back. Large companies are uncertain about their legacy industries and businesses. And when you have all that uncertainty, that creates an unbridled amount of opportunity. Um, you know, it's some, sometimes out of tragedy comes opportunity. But my question for you is, um, it seems like you're really optimistic. How do you navigate that when there are so many people who are hurting? We're talking about tens of millions who filed for unemployment, people who are seeing their very livelihoods hurt. And also, we're having a conversation about uh, mental health right now, which has become a crisis in and of itself. How do you remain so optimistic? It's brutal. I mean, it's horrific. There's no way to sugarcoat it. Um, there's no way to spin it. It is just awful. But at the same time, the only way to solve those problems is to to really focus on trying to solve them or trying to come up with solutions, or at least where you can't solve them, suggestions, or even if I can just impact on the margins and make it better for just a few people. You know, and that's why I'm optimistic because I, I want to keep that grind going. I want to keep that, you know, that eye on and trying to to help. And you know, there, there's a it feels good to help people. You know, and that's what keeps me optimistic. You know, I just trying to have an impact. I think one of the things uh, about you, Mark, is it's about leadership. You have been calling out leadership or lack thereof on both sides of the aisle throughout this. And it's something that we do need. So uh, how do you kind of assess the leadership? How would you grade the leadership in Washington, D.C.? How do you grade the administration's response to this crisis? Well, it's not just administration. I think politically, we got off to a better start, right? I think the president was a lot more open-minded. He was a lot more deferential to experts and scientists when we needed it. And then something flipped and it, he went in a completely different direction. But it's not just him, right? Because, and again, I, I don't, it sounds like I'm throwing him under the bus because I just, I think he could have done better. But when you have imperfect information, you make imperfect decisions. But then you look to Congress, Right. And there's really nobody that stands out that we can trust. And let's just talk about something that that was horrible that happened that really came from the Democratic side, as best I understand it. When we looked at the PPP program, right, the reason why PPP was a good idea was that if you could get money to small businesses with 500 or fewer employees quickly, the operative word being quickly, if not very quickly, that once they had that money in the bank, they would be able to they would have the money to retain employees. The longer that money was delayed, the more likely that they were going to lay people off or fire them. Well, why was that money delayed? It was delayed in a lot of respects because the Democrats kept on trying to get funding for museums and kept on trying to get funding for all these other things. And every day that was delayed out of that just made things far worse and added to the unemployment. And then part three, we have Treasury. Right. So here where where we are right now, we've got all these companies that we that are basically in a state of suspended animation. Right. They may or may not be able to open up. They laid off employees, but they can't get them back because they can't afford to bring it back, either because they can only open up partially, if at all. And because 68 percent of, of, of people who are on unemployment make more off of unemployment than they do from their former job. So the employees, the employers can't afford to bring them back. So they're, they're stuck in never, never land. That's a huge problem. Yeah, Mark, I think you bring up some really good points, too. And I should have mentioned at the top of this, a lot of people know you as an investor on Shark Tank, and you really do have a pulse on the small, medium-sized business community, as well as your own experience in corporate America. So uh, thank you for bringing up those those issues. So like, I guess my question for you, Mark, is how do we kind of restart or, or get back to growth? Because a lot of it, the PPP and the, the stimulus checks, it's, a, it's kind of a Band-Aid for a wound, if you will. So how do you jumpstart the growth right. when you can't even operate at full capacity? Great question, Julia. So let's start with the reality. The, the primary reality is no business can survive without sales. And two thirds of the economy is consumer generated demand. And so we've got to get to a scenario where com uh, consumers have enough confidence to go out there and spend money. And so there's a couple of ways that we can do that. You got it? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I got it. <laughs> It's happened to me. So, yeah. so there's a couple of ways we can do that. One, you've got to you've got to make it so people have have confidence in their jobs, right? 
And right. we're going to have to have a transitional, not permanent, transitional federal jobs program. And so we're going to need to hire people, millions of people, you know, preferably for testing, tracing, tracking, um, supporting vulnerable populations, long-term care, you know, giving people jobs that they know are stable because that gives them the impetus to spend money. Two, we're going to have to have a perfectly timed stimulus program. So what does that mean? Well, I talked about companies in suspended animation. You've got all these PPP companies that can't fully open, can't bring back the employees because they're making too much already, but that ends on July 31st, right? That's when that the CARES program employment stimulus ends. And so I think we need to do um, a debit card program where we give money literally to each household and have make it user to lose it, whether it's 1,000 or 1,200 or whatever that number is every couple of weeks and say, you have X number of days to use this debit card or you lose the money that's been deposited on there. Because by doing that and timing it right, that's going to create demand for these companies so they can afford to bring their employees back after they're off of all that unemployment cares enhancement. Mark, I always love how you, you come with new ideas and solutions and you think about how to problem solve. It just seems like that's in your DNA. Now, I've asked you a couple of times on Yahoo Finance's live programming, if you're thinking about that presidential run uh, in 2020, we're getting down to the, the wire here. Right. Uh, I would love to pose that question to you. And also, if you were in office, what would be one of the fundamental things that you would change that we have not yet mentioned in this conversation? Okay, so it's highly unlikely because of timing, as you mentioned, but stranger things have happened. So you know me, Julie, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm never going to say no. But to answer your question directly, healthcare, right? We haven't even had a, a basic discussion about what happens to healthcare now that you know we've got 39, 40 million people who are unemployed, and who knows how many because they reduced hours or reduced wages are underemployed. So we went from an environment where we had 45 million people who were eligible for the ACA and 150 million who were on their employer payroll. Um, payrolls that could get an insurance insurance programs through health insurance through their employer. Now those numbers can be completely backwards where we may have 90 million people or whatever, you know, 45 plus 30, let's say 75 million people who are eligible for the ACA and maybe only 110 on employer-based insurance. That creates a whole set of issues in terms of having people have a safety net and being able to be to take care of their families if somebody gets sick. You know, and not just from COVID, from all the other things we get sick from. And so no one's had even the briefest conversation about that. That's awful, right? Again, that goes back to leadership from both sides. And so that's the first thing I would do. Well, Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, investor on Shark Tank. Thank you so much for joining us on Reset Your Mindset. Thanks for having me, Julia. Always fun. Straight ahead on the Reset Your Mindset special brought to you by Yahoo in partnership with Fortune. Our small business roundtable featuring Verizon Business CEO Tammy Irwin, Farm Girl Flower CEO Christina Stemble, and Crisis Text Line CEO Nancy Loveland. That's coming up next. And once this is over, which it, at some point it will be, uh, we have to start thinking hard about what kind of society we have created and what protections we need to put in place to, uh, to protect all, all people who, who work uh, and, and, and have, the better, have a better life for them. So it's made us think about it in a really dramatic fashion. There are moments in this tragedy that people can't have that when loved ones are dying. But for a lot of us, the daily challenges we face, there are a lot of moments where we can say, wow, there is so much good I still have. There's so much good I can do. I've taught my kids that one of the things to do when they feel sad and lonely is reach out to someone. Call their grandparents who's, who are quarantining home alone. Reach out and try to make someone else feel better. And those are the moments where I think um, that bring us together. I've got an amazing team. Um, and now, you know, in these, in these unexpected crisis moments, and this one is, you know, sort of, uh, you know, historic. I mean, this one is uh, really gonna be for the record books. Um, that's when you see the power of, you know, having invested in great talent, um, as well as having invested in things like digital, which seemed a little far-fetched when we started doing it. And now obviously everyone understands why it's so essential.
Welcome back to Reset Your Mindset, a Yahoo and Fortune special. I'm Tammy Irwin, and I'm the CEO of the Verizon Business Group. And, you know, as we think about COVID and the impact on small businesses, they have most directly been impacted by this crisis. A recent survey that we saw suggested that about 50% of overall businesses are in danger of failing. And yet, as you've heard throughout the day, there's an incredible sense of optimism about how business are thinking about reimagining and really using the resiliency that small businesses uh, possess to think about what their future might look like. And I'm really delighted to have a chance to have Christina Stembell, who's the CEO of uh, Farm Girl Flowers, and Nancy Lublin, who's the CEO of Crisis Text Line, join me this afternoon to engage in a dialogue and conversation about how we're managing through this crisis. Nancy, you're certainly on the front line. You're seeing how COVID has impacted all of our lives. Um, in particular for women, I think about 85% of essential workers are women. And then, of course, they carry much of the um, home duties, whether it's educating or cooking or cleaning or all of it. Uh, and you're in the thick of it with the crisis text line. Talk a little bit about what you're hearing is the mindset of where we are now about 70 days into this crisis. We've basically seen three waves of, of emotion. The first wave was anxiety, intense anxiety, words like panic, freaked out, and reference to symptoms. That was starting in the end of February. The next wave uh, we saw was the impact of the quarantines themselves. That was felt, felt most intensely by the 18 to 35-year-olds, what I would consider the adulting age group. Um, and they were disrupted in three ways. One is they moved back home. Their housing yeah. situations, yeah. they are back home in their childhood bedroom, which feels like a defeat. Or they're sheltering alone, or they have mm -hmm. a new young family, and it's very hard to shelter with little kids. Or they're with roommates they met on Craigslist, and they're thinking, I never thought I was going to spend this much time with you. The second yeah. way they were disrupted was their careers, right? Their, their school, their jobs. They were the first to be furloughed, first to let go. And the third thing that was disrupted was dating, relationships. Mm -hmm. that You can't date in a world where you're supposed to wear a mask and say six feet apart. So uh, they've really been disrupted. And the third wave of emotion that we've seen um, is the impact of the grief and the job mm -hmm. loss. Mm -hmm. And we expect mm -hmm. this third wave to last a very long time. You know, Christina, I think about your business and you started Farm Grow Flowers in your apartment. It's now a growing $33 million business with 100 employees. But you've had to face some really difficult decisions over the last several weeks. Talk a little bit about how your company is navigating through this coronavirus pandemic. Yeah, it, what you mentioned, Nancy, those emotions, I felt all of those emotions very acutely and very quickly. Um, you know, to have 12 and a half hours to shut down a, a company, basically, uh, where 90% of your operation you have to shut down in such a short amount of time, the first feeling is just tremendous fear, you know, like that something that you've just spent 10 years of your life, 120 hours a week building, you know, at no you know, no reason or rationale for what you've done. It's just an outside circumstance that nobody budgets, you know, or puts in their financial model, you know, a pandemic line, you know? And so, you know, we're bootstrapped. We're a high growth company. We were on track to do 50 million this year. We had 197 team members um, the morning of March 16th. And I had to furlough all but six that day in 12 hours with no notice. Mm -hmm. And then figure out how to move thousands of orders to another facility that didn't have the infrastructure to set up to do that and how to communicate with our customers, thousands of customers, their orders were going to be late. And then to figure out if I was going to be able to stay afloat. So, Christine, I think you've given us a very specific example of how you've had to play that out. And, Nancy, I want to come back to you and talk a little bit about what guidance would you give us as employers? I know I've worked very hard to make sure that I care for my employees, my customers, my shareholders, society at large. What advice would you give Christina, give Verizon as we think about how we show up on behalf of our employees based on what you're seeing and hearing? So we are seeing some things that work that are helping people feel strong. Taking the big, massive, overwhelming, unknown, unpredictableness of this and shrinking it into time bites that seem more manageable. Saying to your coworkers and your friends and family, what are you going to do tonight to stay strong? What are your plans for tomorrow or for Memorial Day weekend? So thinking in shorter time frames will help 
give you a sense of control. And then I will tell you that people are really looking to family, friends, and pets. Christina, maybe some advice as we think about small businesses. One of the things I'm very proud of at Verizon is we've been very involved in the Pay It Forward program. We've donated $7.5 million uh, to small businesses in grants of $10,000. And I love it because I know that every dollar is going to rebuild for small businesses. What advice would you give us as we think about where we are today for small businesses? Yeah, so I think that the difference between the companies that make it and don't make it are the ones that are willing to do the hard things, the things that you don't want to do, to pivot, which is what we had to do. We had to change our entire distribution model in five weeks and open four additional distribution centers in different places, which meant while we couldn't save our jobs in San Francisco, we could save jobs in other places, which is a really hard thing to do, but you just have to do the hard things and rethink of the way you're doing business to change it because this is going to be a new normal and you have to pivot very quickly before you run out of money. I love it. Do the hard things and be willing to reimagine. Christina and Nancy, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll be right back. Coming up next on the Reset Your Mindset special brought to you by Yahoo in partnership with Fortune. We'll speak with WW International CEO Mindy Grossman, along with the Dr. Patrice Harris, president of the American Medical Association. Stay with us. Welcome back to Reset Your Mindset. I'm Andy Serwer, Editor-in-Chief of Yahoo Finance. I want to bring in our next two guests, Mindy Grossman, the CEO of WW International, and Dr. Patrice Harris, who is the president of the American Medical Association. Welcome to both of you. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Great to see you. Good to see you guys as well. So I want to start with Dr. Harris and ask you, you're a psychiatrist, and just sort of ask you, generally speaking, what is going on with the mental health of Americans through this crisis? Well, let's set a little bit before this crisis. We were having an increase of adolescents and adults who were experiencing anxiety. I have seen an increase in, unfortunately, the number of suicides and uh, suicide attempts in adolescence. So that was pre-COVID. And now we have this crisis, which actually makes us all anxious and worried and fearful. And so we have now a crisis on top of a crisis. And we are seeing, uh, in addition to those feelings, people have to be, in order for us to be safe, uh, isolating. And we're seeing increased feelings of loneliness. So uh, with this current pandemic, we are seeing increased 
anxiety, feelings of loneliness and isolation that were already um, on top of uh, pre-COVID crisis. And Mindy, over to you, I want to ask you how you shifted the priorities of WW International during this time, and how are you looking to serve the wellness needs of your members during this pandemic? Yes, Andy, we were we have been in the process of a transformation of the business over the last number of years. Uh, on one hand, to not just be the leader in weight loss, but to have an entire holistic approach to support people in health and wellness. And in addition, accelerate our digital transformation. And when we identified what was happening with COVID, we made a very quick pivot because we had to pause all of our physical studios around the world where we had 30,000 workshops a week to support the safety and security of both our employees and our members. And we pivoted the product tech team. And in six days, we trained 14,000 coaches and guides um, and simultaneously in 12 countries launched all those workshops virtually. And we've been supporting that throughout this whole time. And right. as you were hearing from Dr. Harris, one of the things that was so important to us was ensuring that not only could we support the safety and security, but that we could keep the community together for motivation and support in a time of isolation. What that has done is further accelerate our digital strategy. Before this time, we were already planning to launch later in the year a whole new vertical of the company around digital, which is about 5 million of our members are all digital, about 25% also went to the studios, um, but with personal and group coaching, and that is still on track. And what we're seeing, because we do see behavior in real time, imagine 5 million people tracking every day their food, right. their activity, um, they're talking on our social channels, and we're monitoring the conversations in our virtual workshops. Right. Um, and this idea of needing support, feeling vulnerable, um, but there's been a really big pivot recently to significant conversations around health and wellness and priorities and reassessment of right. priorities. Right. I, I want to uh, jump in there, Mindy, and ask Dr. Harris about what individuals can do to make themselves healthier mentally being home. And, and also, what can companies do, Dr. Harris, to help uh, out their employees as well? So you heard me talk about worry and fear and action, but I think overall we are a resilient country, right? And what we can do is channel uh, that worry, uh, those fears into action. And I always say individual actions can make collective impact. So the most important thing I think individually is to make sure we are practicing self-care. Mindy talked about wellness. And so first of all, we have to give ourselves grace to feel the feelings that we're feeling, the fear and the worry. Don't beat ourselves up. We don't have to be perfect parents. You know, we don't have to have these expectations of doing it all because we're all learning as we're growing here. We we can make sure we are sleeping as best we can. We can make sure we are eating as healthily as we can. Although again, give ourselves grace. We can move, we can exercise. And again, I've said, you know, not everyone has the privilege. We need to make sure we have privileged conversations of going outside even or having a safe neighborhood. But I always say, even in your own home, you can put on your favorite record and dance. And so we can do that individually. And I'm gonna just make one more point about um, action and, and, and channeling that worry into action. There will be a new normal, uh, as people always say, and we will we'll need to make sure that our services and support for mental health needs are ready. And so right now we need to be preparing and businesses need to be preparing um, as to what they can do to support uh, their employees um, when we get or as we are getting to the new normal. All right, lots more to talk about here, but unfortunately we've got to wrap. So uh, Dr. Patrice Harris and Mindy Grossman, thank you both so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Always great to see you. The same here, thanks for having us. Thanks Dr. Harris.
Straight ahead on the Reset Your Mindset special brought to you by Yahoo in partnership with Fortune. We're joined by Drybar founder, Ali Webb. You won't want to miss it. Welcome back. One of the key components to improving your mental health is self-care. And what better way to boost your confidence than by getting your hair done? Since opening its doors just 10 years ago, beauty salon chain Dry Bar has taken its LA area beginnings and expanded to more than 100 locations, now employing over 3,000 people throughout the US and Canada. By focusing on one very particular piece of the beauty industry, Drybar has found success in simplicity and plans to continue its growth long after lockdown. Our guest today is Allie Webb. She's an entrepreneur, New York Times bestselling author, and the founder of Drybar. Allie, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, Ali, we're going to have a bigger conversation around mental health, mental wellness, those sorts of things. But I just want to get your take on the last two months. I'm sure you've done a lot of reflecting uh, during quarantine. What is top of mind for you these days? Well, you know, I think it's, you know, for me, it's been a lot about trying to to see the silver lining and, and all of this. Um, and, you know, for as challenging as it is, I mean, I feel, you know, lucky to have, you know, to be safe and um, healthy uh, and in a place where I can comfortably quarantine. Uh, I think, you know, it's kind of like this range of emotions I think that we all are experiencing. It's like, you know, some, some days are better than others and you try to stay in your routine. Yeah, it's certainly a good thing to bring up the quality time, the silver linings, if you will. I have to imagine as a founder, a businesswoman, has COVID-19 uh, caused, you, caused you at all to rethink your business strategy? Well, I mean, not so much the strategy um, per se, but more of like what it what it has forced us to do, which I think has been a good thing is like, you know, right now the majority of our stores are closed. We've opened in two markets that are safe to open in and there's completely new protocols. Like there, you know, you're every other chair, a clients are in every other chair. It's a virtual check-in. People are being kind of screened before they walk in, our stylists are wearing masks, like, you know, so, that was certainly not not a strategy we ever thought we'd have to engage with. Um, but you know, I mean, I think that there'll be some good things that come out of that. I mean, I mean, virtual check-in is amazing. Um, you know, and and obviously our biggest priority as a company right now is the safety of our clients. So you know, it's more of a pivot than you know a change of strategy. I mean, we have a lot of plans to open a lot more stores and to do a lot more things that you know we're hoping we will still be able to get to. But you know, just pushed a bit down the road. So, 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's really challenging for, you know, businesses like ours and anybody in the service industry, as you know, you know, it's just like you're you're just so stuck and there's really not much you can do. I mean, I've done, you know, more hair tutorials than I can count, um, just trying to give women, you know, some tips and tricks for when they're at home because we're still doing things like this and we're still actually seeing each other. You know, your hair looks so great. I feel like maybe you've watched them. <laughs> no, I did see those. And actually, well, you bring up a good point. It's like... Yeah. And before it's like I didn't really want to, you know, do my hair and things like that. But it kind of gives you a sense of routine. And we were talking earlier when you sit down in the chair with the stylist. It, it kind of almost feels like a mini therapy session as that's well. Cool. And it's it's the like it's the psychology of the blowout. That's that's really the thing. Just like you know we were saying in the beginning, it's like when your hair looks good or you feel good about your makeup, your outfit, whatever the thing is for you, it makes you, it, it, you know, internally feel great. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many women over the years have told me they don't go to a board meeting without a blowout because it's this extra, like, it's like a power suit. It's like this extra kind of layer of confidence that they're getting. So I don't see that, you know, impacting us, you know, that, that people are gonna, you know, see like, oh yeah, I've, ha I've had enough of good hair. Ali Webb, the founder of Dry Bar, and also we have Squeeze coming up, another venture of yours as well. I should mention that. Thank you so much for joining us. Coming up on the Reset Your Mindset special brought to you by Yahoo in partnership with Fortune. We talked to Verizon Media CEO, Guru Garapan, along with Fortune President and CEO, Alan Murray. That's coming up next. Welcome back to Reset Your Mindset at Work. I'm Julia LaRoche, and I'm honored to bring in our next guest. We have Alan Murray, the CEO of Fortune, along with Verizon Media Group's very own CEO, Guru Gorapin. Welcome to you both. Uh, really interesting conversations that we're having around mental wellness, so I'd love to get your reactions. Alan, I want to start with you. Uh, you've been hosting, I've noticed, quite a few CEO calls, and there was one that really caught my attention. It was with Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff, and he revealed to you a startling statistic around mental health at, at his company that something like 36% of employees reported having mental health issues. I'm wondering, what are you hearing from the C-suite of America these days? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a big issue, and, and we would all make a mistake if we overlook it. Uh, I don't quite know how Mark Benioff got that figure of 36%, but he was quite confident and quite precise on it. And then the same day, uh, I was on a call with the CEO of Synchrony, and she said something very similar, that they had seen a pronounced increase in calls to their mental health distress line. And I think it's a lot of the things you've been talking about for the last hour. I mean, 
there's stress that comes from the pandemic itself. Uh, a lot of people are feeling stress from isolation. Some people are having domestic problems that have been uh, exacerbated by the situation we're all in. Uh, and I, I think it's something that's uh, really important and shouldn't be overlooked. It certainly is. And Guru, I want to bring you into this because even long before the pandemic, I noticed at work uh, that you all were doing a lot around mindfulness, meditation, mental wellness, those sorts of things. I would like to know from your perspective as a CEO, why was that such an important critical step even before the pandemic? And then how do you think the pandemic is only going to amplify the importance of those initiatives? So, no, thanks, Julia. One of the things that I've always said, and Alan, I've talked about this too, which is your mind is your master. So when you think about that, you have to nourish and take care of it. And, and it's unfortunate, but also I think there's a silver lining in this pandemic that it's become a forcing function for companies to really tackle mental health head on. And it's been you know exciting to hear all the different speakers and even what Alan has shared in terms of insights about how people are changing at a personal level. But I think we started early on. And in many ways, we've always said that investing in this, keeping your employees healthy and happy, mentally, emotionally, physically, then they're more productive. And you know, it's as simple as that when you start thinking about that. Yeah, yeah and, and, and Guru, there's another important thing going on that I hear in these CEO conversations, and I thought Mark Bertolini captured it very yeah. nicely. There's a fundamental change in the way the economy and business operate today from 10, 20 years ago. He talked about how we used to steward scarce, you steward the scarce resources and you overuse the abundant mm -hmm. resources. It used to be financial resources that were steward, that we were stewards of, and it was people who solved the problems. And there really has been a change uh, with the rise of tech, uh, the increase in the value of intellectual property, uh, the finance is now the abundant resources. It's the people who are so critical to companies today. You have to pay attention to the people or you risk undermining your most important assets. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more, Alan. I think that's how you know we've been, of course, approaching. And it's good to see finally everybody stepping up to this. Uh, but there's so much more work to be done. I think you both bring up a really important point, and, and I'll pose this question to both of you. I'll start with you again, Alan. Um, the business community's response to the pandemic, I was wondering if you could assess that. And do you think people are starting to understand uh, the role of business? And we, we're in this theme uh, of stakeholder capitalism and the, the importance of stepping up and taking care of all of your stakeholders, which also includes your employees, not just yeah. your shareholders. Yeah, well, as you know, Julia, the, the, the move towards stakeholder capitalism was well underway before the crisis hit. And frankly, I wondered, geez, everybody's in a crisis. They have to look at their bottom line. Maybe this stuff will go away. But interestingly, it's been the exact opposite. I think the nature of the crisis has um, emphasized the importance of a move to stakeholder capitalism. And if you look at like what's going on in the pharmaceutical industry, for instance, where you have companies that used to be extremely short-term bottom line focused and hoarding their intellectual property, all working together, trying to find solutions to the health problems. Uh, it's a very different way of operating than we're accustomed to seeing in the past. So I do think there's a, there are some silver linings to this crisis and things moving in a, in a good direction. I, uh, Guru, I don't know if you see it the same way. I see and it's, it's amazing that you mentioned it. If you think about the four stakeholders, right? It's the employees, customers, shareholders in society. If I think about the previous world, you, you know, most companies you think about as customers, shareholders, then somewhere the employees and then share, you know, society trickles down. The biggest change here, which is employees first. Now, mm -hmm. what do you do for employees in society? That's your input. So I always say employees in society is your input. The output is what you, what you show to the shareholders and what you show to the customers. In a way, I think it's, it's coming down to that in terms of stakeholder. And, and I think this pandemic, the silver lining, as you said, Alan, is it's really accelerated that, uh, you know, that change. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and along those lines, Guru, um, we're talking about addressing uh, some of the challenges, maybe some of the gaps within society. And right now, I know Verizon Media, mental health is incredibly important to them. Uh, announcing, you know, uh, 10 million in added inventory for the cause. I'm... I want to get your thoughts on what do you think the role is of Verizon Media in addressing this crisis? Yeah, you know, I would step back a little bit, Julia, Julia, and I will say that large corporations need to step up 
in times of crisis. I think Alan is saying the same, we're seeing the shift. You know, we made, when I think about Verizon Media more broadly, less about a statement, but more truly saying it's a priority internally. Let's start with ourselves first, our employees, and then externally. So internally, uh, you know, uh, people have seen it, we made mandatory health education for all employees. That's mandatory, people are going through it right now. You know, in some cases we've started the pilot, the idea is by fall, you know, most of them would have gone through it. We also now provide 24 by seven crisis support, counseling, mindfulness programs, community support through our neurodiversity ERG. And, and in the last piece that you mentioned, we've of course, you know, Verizon overall, we've contributed to the COVID response overall, but part of that, out of the more than 50 million that we contributed, about 10 actually was dedicated to mental health organizations who've seen a spike in demand in their services. So a lot of that. And then from a consumer and society perspective, you launched Yahoo Life, which was all around mental, physical, emotional well-being, really going after it. So the, the first and foremost, I always say in mental health is, first of all, you've got to take care of yourself. So for me personally, what do you do for yourself and your employees? And then how do you start working with community and society broadly? Mm -hmm. Good points to bring up. And, and in closing for both of you, uh, this pandemic has created a lot of time to reflect. And I'm wondering if there's anything that's maybe shifted your own mindset, anything that's changed for you all personally. I don't know who has time to reflect. I've never been busier in my life. It's amazing how eliminating the commute time and the moving time has forced us all to sit on Zoom calls from uh, 8 o'clock in the morning until nine o'clock at night. I, I, I think the biggest change I hear from businesses that I agree with is that the ability to do things virtually has turned out to be much more powerful and much more effective than we thought. I think it's gonna cause a big change in the way we work in the future. I, I agree with Alan. And it will be interesting to see a year from now when a lot of them, a lot of us are used to working from home, but then normal life comes back a year or a year and a half you know, you have the vaccine and you have the herd immunity and all of that, how your personal life interacts with your work life, it'll be interesting. I think to Alan's point too, I mean, we're all learning as we speak. I mean, this is the first time I, I heard this about 11,000 years in humanity, where first time we're all facing the same issue and we're solving that. What yeah. big change and habit, I think, you know, Alan and I, we've talked about is brought in. I think it's built a lot of resiliency. We're seeing it. I'm seeing it in CEOs and our teams it's really brought in a lot of acceptance. You can't do much. I mean, you have to say, this is what it is and we're gonna do what we can and walk through it. I do come back to, I think the big difference is self-care and taking action, which is whatever is in your control, right? Really focusing on that. And I felt like there was also a lot of the speakers today from Mark Cuban to Dr. Harris to our Serena Williams, everybody were really talking around, you know, how do you become more resilient? How do you accept it? How do you take care of yourself? And how do you act, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, and I would learning experience for us all, Guru and Alan. Thanks so much for joining us and for some parting thoughts. Uh, let's bring in Andy Sower, editor in chief of Yahoo Finance. Andy, what were your what was your reaction from today's conversation? Well, just sort of adding on to Alan and Guru's points, I think we're really in a new era where mindfulness and the employees is the number one constituent. I think is going to be front and center and critical to work going forward from here, Julia. All right, well, Andy, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our guests for joining us, to all of our viewers at home. I hope you will continue this conversation with us uh, across Verizon Media Group's uh, platforms. We'll have more to come on yahoo.com. I'm Julia Roche, Yahoo Finance correspondent. Have a good night and be well.